So we're going to start off with a real fast review of integrable, able to be integrated. So right away, this is an improper integral right here because we're going to infinity. So regardless of what type of function f is, the fact that we're going integrating to infinity means it's an improper integral. So how did we deal with this in Calc 2? Yep, so we just pick. So that's the reason it's tricky. So we just let, uh, <coughs> we just use a letter b, a variable b in here, and then take the limit as b approaches infinity. So we do our calculus, our antiderivative first, and then at the end you apply your limit. Uh, so I'm not going to go over all that right now. <coughs> but this integral converges So this integral converges when the integral equals some number L. So this number needs to be a real number. So if you get infinity or negative infinity, or anything else is not a number, then you would say it does not converge. So that's what it means to converge. So let's do a uh, quick example for determining conversions or diversions. So divergence is not convergence. And we'll start out integral 0 to infinity, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. And next one, really similar, except don't square the x. 1 over 1 plus x. All right, so figure out which one converges, which one diverges. And for the one that converges, you also have to tell me the value it converges to. So there's some amount of area that's finite, some number that you need to find. So do that right now. So the first thing I did was drop limits in for the <laughs> infinite endpoint, and I used B for the first one, A for the second one. I could have gone B and B, but then I'd have two Bs that mean something slightly different right next to each other on the page. So I decided to just use a different letter. <clears throat> so these integrals are pretty easy to do. What is tangent inverse of zero? So 
So let's say you don't know tangent inverse of zero. What you can do is let, you could either use theta or any other letter. I'll go with theta equals tangent inverse zero. So flipping the function the other side, that means tangent theta equals zero. So what's that? That would be for one. Because that would be the x is, in the, is equal to the y. So 0, tangent is uh, y over x, so you want a 0 for your y. So that angle would be 0 right there. So that's tangent inverse 0 is 0. So that means theta equals 0. So right up here, that means that theta is 0. What is tangent inverse of infinity? It is pi over 2. So why is it pi over 2? Tangent function looks like this. And then you have to invert it. So switch x and y. And you just keep going to the right, and you approach that positive. Uh, horizontal asymptote y equals pi over 2. So pi over 2 is a rational number, but it's still a real number. So that converges to that number. So next one, ln of 1. That's 0. That one's not too bad. What is ln of infinity? Or infinity plus 1. That's also infinity. So this was one of the properties we looked at in Calc 2. We looked at, we did this geometrically. But that is infinity. So because it's infinity, diverge. So I'll write down some useful limits. They'll look a little strange at first, why we're so obsessed with with uh, e to a power, but that will become more clear very soon. Now there's plenty of other identities, but these are ones that will definitely be useful for what we're going to do. And these are s's, not 5's. So I won't use the number 5 for a while. So if s, <coughs> if s is positive, then e to the negative sx over s. Now, of course, s is constant right here, so you can bring that 1 over s outside. So it really comes down to. Uh, the e to the negative sx, and that is 1 over e to the sx. So as x gets bigger and bigger, that gets smaller and smaller. So some of these limits are not difficult to just see what they are. You don't even need L'Hopital's rule in that first one. I don't know why this one's written down also. It seems really obvious. But it's in the notes, so I'll write it down as well. S is constant. This one also works if s is greater than 0. So if you multiply by an x, the e to the negative sx gets smaller more quickly than the x gets bigger. So even though you're multiplying a larger and larger quantity, the other uh, term you're multiplying by is much smaller. And last up.
even if you crank up the power of n, you still get 0. And still, if s greater than 0. And this works for any, any real number n. Doesn't even need to be an integer. Can be negative or positive. And again, these are all s's. None of these are 5's. So that last one is over, over s? No, and I'm not sure why. I copied out a textbook. It seems pretty clear because the uh, you can bring that constant multiple out as a one over s squared. So I don't know why they're writing the s squareds here. So I, the s the s's don't seem terribly important. So we have a theorem. If the integral is 0 to infinity, e to the negative sx times f of x dx. So if this is some finite value k for a real number. So if this converges for some s, <coughs> equals s naught then it also converges for every s greater than s naught so if you can find one s value this converges for it's guaranteed to converge for all the bigger values of s and <clears throat> what happens when s increases Basically, e to the negative of sx gets smaller faster. So that's what's happening if uh, the value of s increases. You're actually going to get a smaller number out of this. So now we come to the definition of Laplace transform. You do need a continuous function, the Laplace transform of a continuous f. And I'm going to write this a little bit compactly. So our function f is continuous on its domain, which needs to be 0 to infinity. So function's domain is 0 to infinity, and the range is going to be some real numbers, not necessarily all of them. But it's important you need your domain to be 0 to infinity because we're going to be throwing these into integrals from 0 to infinity. So you're going to need to be defined for all those x values. Or else this up here won't make any sense if your function is not defined. All right, we also need it to be continuous. Uh, so what is the Laplace transform? So the Laplace transform is we use a capital L of f, so it is a function of f. It also could be written as a function of s. And it is the term, the uh, integral we wrote down above, e to the negative of sx times fx dx. So this Laplace transform is a function of s, not a function of x. Why is it not a function of s? Why is it not a function of s? x? I see x is here, but why is the end result? And there's another x right there. Yeah, so when you integrate, you're going to be plugging in. 0 and infinity for everywhere you see x. So there's not going to be x's anymore once you integrate. It's kind of like we use t as a dummy variable sometimes, and then the t's disappear. So it's just like that, except x is the dummy variable now. <coughs> so 
So what we're going to do is find some Laplace transforms now. So we'll take the easiest function, or one of the easiest functions. I think 0 is probably the easiest function, but if I threw 0 in for f of x, there wouldn't be very much work to do. So that's not a very exciting one to look at. So we'll take the first non-trivial one. That's easy. All right, so find L of f. All you have to do is where you see f of x, just drop x in there. So this is just function composition. So I'm using straight off that definition. L of f equals integral 0 to infinity e negative sx fx dx. And I'm just going to, wherever I see f of x, I'm just going to write x in its place. So we have an improper integral. So we need a limb b approaches infinity integral 0 to b. I'm going to write the x term first, x times e to the negative sx dx. How in the world do we integrate this thing? Integrate by parts. That is correct. And you should be able to integrate by parts in exactly one um, iteration. So when we go integration by parts, what choice should we make for you? So u should be x, and then that forces dv to be e to the negative sx dx. So you need to find v, and I'll do du. du is just dx. So you need to figure out what is v, and then go ahead and use integration by parts. And if integration by parts not on your cheat sheet, it needs to get on there uh, for Laplace transforms, at least. Well, unless you know it already, in which case you don't need to write it on your cheat sheet. And don't touch the limit until you're done with all your antiderivative. So don't apply limit until pretty much the last step. And if you don't feel like rewriting lim b approaches infinity, lim b approaches infinity, you can do your calculus somewhere separately and then bring your result back to here. So if you want to keep rewriting lim, 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 just do your calculus somewhere else and then come back with your antiderivative. <coughs>
So what are these limits going to be? So we got first one is zero, and that comes from the somewhere up here, this guy. Now, if you don't have this on your cheat sheet, how would you go about showing that first limit is zero if you had to do it by hand? It's a little weird because b is our uh, variable, so that seems a little strange. You do look at child's rule, but you have to write it like this first. So it was infinity over infinity. And then you would use Lucky child's rule derivative of that over derivative. So that's how you would, if you didn't have that identity, you'd have to go and use Lucky child's rule here. So we got 0 <coughs> plus. This one's actually even easier. There's only one variable in it. And it <coughs> makes the uh, numerator get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that one's. Pretty easy to see a zero without using any identity. So we got a bunch of zeros plus one over s squared. So our Laplace transform, or the Laplace of the identity function, is one over s squared. So it basically comes down to, you got to know the definition, of course, or else there's no way you're going to get to the right uh, value at the end. But you got to know the definition. You're going to have to do an antiderivative, which very likely could be integration by parts, because no matter what, you're going to have a function multiplied by e to the negative sx. So it might be uh, integration by parts will work out more so than it does in general. So maybe it works out 10% of the time in general. It'll probably work out a bit more than 10% here. And then, of course, you got to take your limit carefully, which could use L'Hopital's rule um, or some of the other identities. So don't forget those skills for Laplace. All right, so that is the Laplace of the function. So this is called the Laplace transform. Not everything is a linear operator, but everything that's to do with derivatives is pretty much a linear operator. All right, so Laplace transforms linear operator. What does it mean to be a linear operator? <coughs> what property? So if it's a linear operator, it means if it's a Laplace of the sum, that's the same as the Laplace of each one added together. And the same thing works out for scalar multiplication. So that means alpha f plus beta g is alpha L of f plus beta L of g. So it splits up over addition and scalar multiplication. So let's prove that quickly. I think it should be very easy to prove. Here, alpha and beta are. Uh, just real numbers, so they're constants. <coughs> so I'm going to use the definition here. So the Laplace is the integral e negative sx times our function, which is alpha f plus beta g. So that was just using definition. And now properties of the integral. So I can distribute right here. So I can write this as alpha e negative sxf plus beta e negative sxg dx. So I just distribute it out. And then you know the sum of two functions. You can just integrate that separately. And I'll skip a step. I'm also going to bring out the scalars from each one. So this first one is alpha 0 to infinity e to the negative sxf dx plus beta integral 0 to infinity uh, e to the negative sx g dx. So just off the fact that uh, of all the properties of antiderivative or uh, definite integrals, we can uh, get the linear property. 
for this operator. So that was relatively painless proof compared to a lot of other stuff we've done. So Laplace transforms a linear operator. So that's what it means right there. Now, <clears throat> in general, the Laplace operator goes from the set of all functions, continuous functions of x, well, on a certain domain, and it takes those and turns them into functions of s. So it's a little bit weird. It takes a function of x and turns it into a completely different function of s. So Laplace transform is a one-to-one -one function. So that means two things. First of all, it's one-to-one, -one, but it's also a function. So what does it mean to be a function? There's only one rule to be a function. It passes the vertical line test. Passes the vertical line test, but I don't think we want to graph what a graph of an input function is going to look like. But what does it mean if you don't want to use the word graph and just using inputs and outputs? So for each input, there is one output. Um, and not only that, that output is not shared by other inputs. So what that lets us do is look at an output and figure out exactly where it came from. In other words, we can invert the operation or invert the function. So the so plus transform is a one-to-one -one function. Thus, L has an inverse or has not an inverse, but has the inverse. The inverse, uh, who cares, definite article, the inverse. And of course, we'll write it as L negative one. So that's how I'll write the inverse operator. So what does one to one mean? So yeah, could, you could say it passes the horizontal line test. Uh, but in this notation, it means if two functions, wait, ah, let's talk about what it means to be a function before we talk about a one-to-one. -one. So it means if you have two inputs that are the same, when you L both of them, the outputs better be the same. So you shouldn't be getting two separate outputs for the same input. And L is one to one means, basically means the inverse. If you know two outputs are the same, it means that it had they had to come from the same input. So that means if L of F1 is the same as L of F2, two outputs are the same, then they had to come from the same input. So what that means, we get the if and only if. So if <coughs> you know two inputs are the same, two outputs are the same, and vice versa. So we can write L inverse of, now I'm going to use the letter, let's switch capital and little f from what the book uses. So L inverse of f is the function little f such that L of little f equals, and actually let me write the equation the other way, such that f equals L of little f.
And if you write this out mathematically without any words, this up. Inverse big F equals little f is the same thing as big F is L of little f. There we go. Too many f's. So this last line I wrote down, you just move the L operator to the other side as the inverse, and it works both ways. And that's actually, if you think of is, means equals the function, which you don't really need, f. That's exactly the same thing. What does the second to last line mean in English? Uh, this one right here? Uh, if you apply the Lapl Laplace operator, the one that, that we just defined, to the function little f, you get the function big F. So we did one example where we actually computed L of f. I just needed two functions and I didn't necessarily want to use letters that weren't F. Okay. So that I could. No. Okay. So it's the, op the Laplace operator, the result of that. Okay. So you could. The derivative is another operator, it's just not that operator, okay. it's this operator. Probably other operators you'll use later too. Uh, also, L inverse is a linear operator as well. Let's go ahead and prove this statement. So I'm going to use capital F and capital G um, for the inputs for L inverse. I could use lower F uh, or little f, little G, but I'm using the little f, little G for the original functions and capitals for the the functions of s basically on the other side. All right, so I'm trying to show, I'll write this in green, I'm trying to show eventually we'll do some work and this should be, is that even legible? No. This should be L inverse, wait, alpha L inverse f plus beta L inverse g. That's what we're trying to show, that it splits up like that. Unfortunately, I don't really know much about the inverse operator. And what we're going to do instead is let's let we'll go with, I'll just let h equal L inverse of this stuff. So I move the operator to the other side. So this is the same as L of H equals alpha F plus beta G. This might be more difficult than it appeared. I do know how to find L of H. Integral zero to infinity, E negative S X H. So I'm not sure where to go over here. So what I'm going to do is cheat and start at the end and work backwards. So I've taught you that technique before. It's not really cheating. I just call it that so you pay attention. So <clears throat> we're trying to show these two things are the same and I call this one H. So that means the other one's going to be H also. So I'm going to switch to the green pen while I cheat and then we'll come back to 
the other colors. So we got H equals L inverse F plus beta L inverse G. The only thing I can think of doing is applying L to both sides. So let's apply, because I can't uh, try to factor out L inverse, that's what I'm trying to show. So I can't just bring L inverse out front. If I could, that's my conclusion. So let's L both sides. Why am I allowed to distribute L across addition and scalar multiplication? So we just proved that it's a linear operator. So the L operator can be treated as a linear operator. We showed that it is a linear operator. We didn't show the inverses yet. So, and of course, L of L inverse is going to cancel out. So cancel, cancel, and we got alpha F plus beta G. And that's L of H. So where in the world are we? Oh, look at that. I don't think we even needed to use this line right here. I think we just want to keep L of H in there. So I'm going to write in reverse the steps we just took. So let's get this out of there. The reason my spidey sense went off here, uh, why did it? Because, well, basically I didn't know what to do next. So I decided to just stop and start at the end. I don't have a good reason other than I couldn't think of the next, the next reasonable thing to do. All right, so L of H is that which is L. So we got that line already written down, so I'm going to go to the one above. <coughs> and now... Oh, we got to be careful. There's a little partition here. We went from H to L of H. This is L of H right here. So <clears throat> I'm going to take L inverse of both sides now. So get the L out of here. Oh, that sounds funny. Somewhere along the way, H was L inverse of this original thing right here. So I'm going to swap that back in. And if you want, you can. Partition this out too because we took the L inverse of both sides. So we undid what we just did in there. All right, that was a fun proof. So L inverse linear operator, and what we're going to do next is actually use these to solve differential equations. So 
the basic way we're going to do it, we're going to start with differential equation that we're used to, and then apply L to both sides. And then we'll see why that's a good idea. Doesn't seem like that's necessarily a great idea right now. But in certain circumstances, it'll work out very well.